All right, so this is the second video for um, memory transport. So we um, left off, we're starting um, to look at basically um, a collection of factors that impact the flux or flow. Um, so basically the magnitude of the driving force. Um, so that's kind of talking about um, concentrations, like how big, how much is the difference between um, the concentrations inside and outside of the cell, um, membrane surface area. So like I said, we kind of talk about how the surface area of cells is kind of a fixed thing. Um, you can't really make a cell a lot bigger or a lot smaller, but you can open and close pores, which can dramatically um, affect the, the surface area of, of a particular ion that can get in and to or out of the cell. Um, we have membrane permeability. So that's looking at what can cross the, the actual membrane itself, that possible lipid bilayer, and then rates of active transport. So um, a passive process does not require energy. So we do also have active transports that require energy um, to move um, molecules or ions across the, the, you know, inside and outside of the cell um, that require energy because you're either using, you're going against concentration gradients or you're changing the shape of that membrane and um, when you change the shape of that it requires energy to occur. All right, so the first thing we're going to look at is driving force. So driving force is going to be if there's a difference in energy existing across um, the membrane. So um, in the example here, they're kind of showing like um, a dam. So if you um, basically create a dam, you hold a whole bunch of water back and then only a little bit can flow through um, that dam. So it, but it's a one way uh, flow because it's going from a high concentration to a low concentration. So molecules are going to go in one direction. So here on the little, um, in this little cell here, we can see all the little red dots. So they're high concentration here, low concentration outside of the cell. So the, that the driving force would be to go from high to the low concentration. So these, this particular ion or molecule is going to go from inside the cell to outside of the cell. When we look at driving forces, they can be chemical, electrical, or electrochemical. So um, what we've really focused on so far is chemical. So we're going to look at those again. So um, when you have a chemical driving force, you're looking at a driving force that, that is created by a concentration gradient. So difference in concentration inside and outside of the cell. Um, so uh, basically you can define that as the rate at which the concentration changes with dis with distance. And so basically when you look at that, if you have a high concentration inside the cell, low concentration outside the cell, the, the chemical driving force is to go from high to low concentration. It's gonna go, it's gonna, you know, use the, the premise of entropy where it's gonna, you know, go to more disorder, but as long as it can pass through that membrane or through pores, it will go from high to low concentration. So the chemical driving forces, they, they move down the concentration gradient, so high to low. So like our little ball rolling down the hill from high potential energy to the low potential energy. So um, it's gonna go downhill. Like I said, it's gonna go high to low when we look at, at that. So the, once again, the greater the concentration gradient, the greater that driving force, the faster the movement. So if you double the concentration, you're going to double that, that driving force and you're going to have a greater flux or flow of those atoms, ions, molecules versus a lower concentration gradient. So we can kind of see that moving. All right, so chemical, like I said, chemical we've been talking about already. So because we were talking about, we're talking about actual physical things like atoms, ions, molecules, but they're actual chemical structures. When we look at electrical driving forces, electrical driving forces um, are going to, you're going to really be looking at things that, that carry a charge because you're going to create a difference of charge inside and outside of that cell. So when we look at this, we're going to be looking at ions and ionic compounds. So things that carry a charge, so they have a positive or negative value 
And then when you have a whole bunch of positive or negative inside or outside the cell, you're going to create a, a difference in electrical charge inside and outside of that cell. And that electrical potential is known as voltage. So we're going to see the difference there. So um, with this, we can kind of see that um, inside of the cell, we're going to see that the inside cells are negatively charged in a normal, healthy cell. And then outside of the cell, it's positively charged. So um, if you have something that's positive, it will want to go into, it's attracted to want to go into the area where it's negative because it's an attraction of opposite charges. So you have to have something that separates those charges. So in this case, it's going to be the plasma membrane. Um, and so you have to have a difference in charge inside and outside of that membrane. And that's going to be membrane potential. It's typically measured in millivolts. So milli is a, a thousandth of a volt. So millivolts. Um, but, but there's going to be a difference of charge inside and outside of the cell. So that's electrical driving force. So when we look at electrical driving forces, um, if you've had to take physics before, I don't know if any of you have taken physics, maybe in high school or um, somewhere along the way, um, they talk about electricity and they talk about resistors and potentials and charges and things like that, voltmeters. So they're going to kind of use, we're going to use those examples because maybe then if you've experienced that, you kind of have a... Uh, kind of like a basis for that. So voltage can only exist if there's a different in charge difference in charges. So you have to have something that separates your charges. So when we look at this, this is our little voltmeter right here. It has two little electrodes. One is the reference electrode and one is the recording electrode. Um, but it will record zero if there's no difference in charge on the two between the two different electrodes there. Excuse me. Um, so you have to have, like, if you're looking at an electrical circuit, you have to have a resistor that's going to separate the charges. So when we look at this here, we can kind of see, um, you know, electrons would travel along this and that would, um, it would pick up, you know, the two, you have the reference and recording electrodes there and it would record um, the voltage on there. If there is no resistor that separates charges, you would read zero voltage because there's no difference between the two um, electrodes, the recording and the reference electrode. So you have to have a resistor that can separate charges between the two sides. So here's a resistor, this little squiggly line, if you've ever, um, like I said, taken physics or read maybe a schematic for something like that, if you've worked with um, electricity, not like turning on your light switch working with electricity, but working with um, plans that have um, to do with electricity. So here we now have a resistor that's going to separate charges on each side there. And once that happens, um, you will be able to, you know, record a difference in charge on one side versus um, the other. So voltage is measured as a difference in the amount of charge on each side of the resistor. So for us, like if you're like, oh, I've never taken physics and I don't exactly know what's going on with, with electrical things, what we're going to really be focusing on is that we have a plasma membrane. Plasma membrane is going to allow certain things to enter and exit the cell. Um, when you start talking about ions and charged particles, they have to use proteins to get in outside of the cell, but you're going to create these, these electrical differences inside and outside of the cell because the plasma membrane kind of acts as a resistor. It acts as that boundary that's going to separate charges inside and outside of the cell. So it's kind of similar to the dam holding back water. Um, so, you know, your little plasma membrane is going to hold certain contents inside the cell. Certain things are going to go through. They can leak out of certain kinds of channels. Um, kind of like water can can go out through that dam. And the flow depends on the dam's ability to resist that flow. So if you've been to like in, like dams like Hoover Dam or some other dam, um, they you know basically put these big dams in place because it 
you know, stops the, the kind of the flow of a river and then they can kind of harness that power as the water goes through, um, you know, and turns turbines and things like that. They can create electricity from the flow of the natural flow of water. So um, the water can only flow through certain areas um, because it's, you know, there's something that's holding it in there. So you have a high concentration of water, you know, inside of the, the dam. And then as it flows out, it's going to an area of lower um, water concentration. So, but like I said, when we're looking at this, we're looking at things that have a charge. So here, the gray is our little cell membrane or plasma membrane. This is inside of the cell and this is outside of the cell. So that plasma membrane, the cell membrane as that resistor or that dam, it's the thing that's holding something back. It's, it's limiting what's on either side of that, that plasma membrane. So it restricts the flow of ions. So remember ions are charged particles. They can't go right through the plasma membrane. They have to go through some sort of channels. And remember, they can't just go through any old channel. There's specific channels for sodium, specific channels for potassium, specific channels for chlorine, chloride ions, specific channels for calcium. So they have to go through the proper channels and those channels can be gated where they're opened or closed, um, so they can't just go wherever, whenever they want. So because of that separation of charges, you create a potential difference. You create, um, in a normal healthy cell, a negatively charged inside of the cell, and then it's positively charged outside of the cell. So that's kind of showing you the plasma membrane it acts as Excuse me, the resistor. Like I said, when I have to talk to myself, I get really tired. And it really shouldn't make any difference, but it somehow does. So um, when you have those separation charges, so here we're showing you, here's the plasma membrane. We have the intracellular fluid, so this is inside of the cell. We have the extracellular fluid, so this is outside of the cell. And here we can see that there's a difference in the concentration. So if we went in here and we counted up all the little red ones that have a negative in them. We have more negative ions inside of the cell in that intracellular fluid than we do on the outside. So over here, if we counted them, we have more of the purple positive um, ions out there. So it's positively charged in the extracellular fluid. Like I said, we're able to have that separation of charges because that plasma membrane can limit what can move into and out of the cell. So we have voltage because of the difference in charge on each side of the cell. So we could use our little voltmeter and put in a measuring and a reference electrode and we could actually measure the voltage inside and outside of the cell. Like we could tell what that, that is. Um, when we start looking at this, um, so this is going to be, um, I don't know. A lot of times people look at it kind of like you have to think about it for a minute. So um, inside of the cell, so we know we just, I just said the inside of your cell is negatively charged. However, the ion that we see, we're going to look at sodium and potassium, and they're really important for the resting membrane potential in our cells. And so potassium is really high inside of the cells at rest and then you have a low concentration of potassium outside the cells. Um, the opposite of true is true of sodium. So there's a lot of sodium outside the cells, sodium ions outside of the cells and relatively low inside of that. So then you're like, okay, potassium's positive, sodium's positive, but somehow I have a negative inside of my cell. So I want you to remember circle K. So like the gas station, do they have circle K's down here? They have them in like up north a little bit. And when I say north, I mean like St. Louis north, not like like north north. Um, so circle K, you have a high concentration of potassium inside of the cell and relatively low outside, high potassium outside, relatively low uh, or sodium outside, relatively low sodium on the inside of the cell. However, you're thinking they're both positive. How do we get negative? Potassium there's lots of really leaky potassium channels that allow potassium to leak constantly outside of the cell. Because remember, high potassium inside the cell, low outside. Naturally, it wants to follow that concentration gradient and go from the area of high concentration of potassium to the area of low concentration of potassium. So it's naturally going to leak out. When it leaks out, um, that leaves their inside of the cell, there are negatively charged 
other negatively charged ions and other compounds and things like that that have negatively charged. So you end up having an overall negative charge inside of the cell because of all that leaky potassium. So you just have to get it in your head. The potassium is still positively charged, but it still helps to create the negative charge of that intracellular fluid. So um, intracellular fluid contains more anions, so more negatively charged things. Um, and so it's, so it's negatively charged when compared to the outside, because you, one, you have more positive things on the outside, plus you have a whole bunch of positive potassium leaking out and going out to that positive, out to the extracellular fluid out here. So when we look at this, negative charges on one side of the membrane are attracted to positive charges on the opposite side. So positive things wants to go into the cell because of the opposite charges. Um, and like I said, you know, negative things would want to go out, but sometimes it's, when we start looking at that plasma membrane, it can be selectively permeable in the sense that it can limit um, negative things leaving the cell. And that helps to establish that concentration gradient. So when we are looking at the potential, the potential difference between um, the, when we look at the inside and outside of the cell, so intracellular versus extracellular fluid, we will measure that electrical potential in millivolts. Like I said, it's one one thousandth of a volt. So a millivolt, that's one one thousandth of a volt. Um, and when we look at this, the greater the difference across that cell membrane, the larger the membrane potential that we will see. We will kind of see that. Um, we'll see in nerve cells, heart cells, epithelial cells, um, typically most of your cells, um, they're, they're negative inside. That's what a normal, healthy cell, what it should, you know, what it should show um, with that. So it's really important for nerve impulses, muscle contraction, whether you're looking at a skeletal muscle or you're looking at uh, cardiac muscle tissue, um, you have to have that separation of charges. So when we look at this, inside cells, it's typically negative. So the intracellular fluid has more anions, negatively charged ions, than cations, a part of positively charged ions. Um, so it's negatively charged inside um, when the cell is at rest. When we start looking at things like um, conduction of nerve impulses, and we talk about the depolarization, then that negative negative charge inside the cell um, becomes positive. But that's uh, a little bit further of a story happening. Um, so when it's negative inside a cell at rest, that's called, called the resting membrane potential. So remember, negative inside of our cells at rest is the, that negative value is the resting membrane potential. So negative inside. So when we look at this, the resting membrane potential of cells, they always say is negative 70 millivolts. So this negative 70, different types of cells have different resting membrane potentials, but they've gone through and I guess averaged a whole bunch of different kinds of cells. And from that, they come up with negative 70 millivolts. Is every cell that they go through and they check um, that voltage, does it have a negative 70? No. Certain cells um, will be, you know, they may be at a negative 40. Others might be at a negative 60. Um, some might be at a negative 80. It depends on the, the cell. But the average is a negative 70 millivolts. And when you look at textbooks, I mean, in this textbook is no different. You could look at an anatomy book or physiology or combined A&P book, and they will tell you that the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Um, you know, like I said, it's kind of the average of all types of cells. Um, and, you know, it's, like I said, what's normal for one type of cell may not be a negative 70 millivolts. It could be slightly different. So that's just the average there that they kind of all agreed upon when they, when they look at books. So, um, but if I ask you, what's the the resting membrane potential I'm talking about, I'm going to use that average, the negative 70 millivolts. So um, when we look at the electrical driving force, how, you know, so chemical driving force is all about 
concentration of different chemicals inside and outside of the cell. That's how they set up a chemical, um, you know, driving force. But an electrical driving force is all about differences in charge inside and outside or on the two sides of your membrane. So a cation, when we start looking at certain types of membranes, you can see they have what's called a cation selective membrane. So that means that that positive ions can pass through the membrane, but negative ions can't, no matter what the, the charge is inside and outside of that cell. So if you have a cation selective membrane, only cations are gonna be able to pass through that membrane. So when we look at this initially, A to B, we have a bunch of positives here, we have equal amounts of negatives, and then over here, we have neither positive or negative. So, but if you look at just the positives from this side, from side A to side B, you have a high concentration of positives here and a low concentration of positives on this side. So naturally they're gonna wanna go from the, you know, a positive to, you know, they, you know they're gonna move from there out to side B. So they can move there until you get kind of to the equilibrium. Now there's, same amount of positives in, inside and outside or from side A to side B. Um, but you'll notice that the negatives did not move through there because this is a cation only membrane. It only allows the cations to pass through. So what happens is it results in one side of the membrane being positive and the other, and you can measure that in millivolts and the other side is negative. Because now if we look at this, because you know, if they could both pass, if the, both the cations and the anions could pass, they would both, you would end up with equal concentration on both sides and then we wouldn't have a membrane potential. But when you have this cation selective membrane, cations will move over. So now you have only cations out here and over here we have anions and cations. And so if we counted up the charges, obviously like these two would, cancel each other out, those two and those two, but then we have three negatives in here. So there's a negatively charged inside the cell, positively charged outside the cell or side A and B that they're looking at, at here. Uh, so positive charge inside Bs will repel the positive charges from side A. So these ones don't wanna come over because it's positively charged over here. So that they're not attracted to that. The negative charges are, would be attracted to this side because it's positive over here and they're negative. However, they are unable to pass through that cation membrane, so they're kind of stuck over there. So that sets up that electrical driving force where you have a negative side and a positive side. Like I said, if both of them could cross equally easily, um, you would end up having that equilibrium state and you wouldn't create those differences in um, voltage there. So when we look at the direction and magnitude of electrical driving forces, you want to look at the different ions. So um, the one thing you want to kind of look at is you want to look at the sign. So we have cations, which are positive, and we have anions, which are negative. So you remember, like I said, if you had Dr. Hawkins, I think he would, he said that cations are positive, like the cat is positive. Um, and then anions, I don't know if he had a tricky or nifty little way to remember that. I just, you remember cations are positive, then you know the anions are negative. So when we look at this, um, we can see that we have sodium as a cation, calcium as a cation, and chloride is an anion because it's negatively charged. Um, so that's the charge. And then we also have the magnitude of that. So we'll notice here that sodium and, and um, calcium are both cations are both positively charged, but sodium is monovalent, whereas as the calcium is considered divalent. It has lost two electrons, so it has an overall plus two charge. So when any when you look at the movement of one sodium versus one calcium, calcium has is is when it when one of them moves, it carries this the charge is a, that's equivalent to two sodiums. So it, it it's carrying more magnitude when you look at, at that, it's more positive because it has two positives compared to the one positive of, of sodium. So um, uh, when we look at that, so sodium is gonna be really important in, like, like I said, it's really important in nerve conduction, things like that. But we also see that the calcium is really important. We're gonna see that it gets involved in things like muscle contraction, but um, calcium channel blockers can create strong, 
and slower heartbeats if you block them. Um, and then if the calcium that goes into the heart is going to cause when it goes in, it can cause that heart to, to beat with a, a greater and stronger um, force. So the electrical driving force is influenced by the by the chemical driving force because um, a lot of times when we start looking at these, when we look at like sodium, for instance, so you could say, okay, we have a high concentration of sodium outside of the cell, sodium ions, and you have a low concentration of sodium ions inside of the cell. Not only are you talking about the chemical there, that chemical carries a charge as well. So when you look at the electrical driving force, it can be influenced by the chemical driving force, or it could be a combination. So a lot of times we start looking at electrochemical, which we're going to kind of see in a minute. So here we have uh, magnitude of electrical driving force depends on the size of membrane uh, potential and the quantity of charge carried by an ion. Like I said, if you have something like calcium that, that is moving, basically has a charge of two versus sodium that has a charge of one, um, that's going to affect the magnitude of that electrical um, driving force. So a divalent is going to carry more, you know, magnitude than a monovalent ion. So here we can kind of see electrical driving force. You know, if we have two here, so negative 50 to negative 100, you can kind of see the <clears throat> when there's just two negatives in here, there's a less uh, attractive force between this positive cation out here. When you increase this, so we've doubled the number of negatives inside. So now we can see that electrical driving force is much stronger. So the size of that membrane potential and then the quantity of the charge carried on that. So this is kind of showing you the size of the membrane potential. So the difference in the millivolts inside and outside. And then here, this is talking about the charge. So like if you have a divalent, this is gonna carry more charge into the cell with just one ion molecule there. So it's all fine and good to talk about chemical driving forces and electrical driving forces, but a lot of times it's really hard to kind of separate them. It's kind of like anatomy and physiology. It's hard to just talk about the structure or just talk about the function. A lot of times you get kind of co-mingling. They, they affect each other. So um, what the structure is affects how it can function. How it functions is dependent on the structure, however you want to think of that. So here with electrochemicals, since a lot of what we're moving are charged particles, you're moving an actual substance, but since it, that substance carries a charge, it, it's kind of like you have both things working together. So electrochemical driving forces, it's kind of necessary to look and determine what the driving forces are to see if it's moving based on ion concentration, um, you know, or charge concentration, the concentration of charges. So um, you, in order to determine if ions are moving um, by active or, tra or passive transport, um, most ions move by a combination of those two forces. Are they moving based on charge or based on concentration or both? So like I said, sometimes it's, it's hard to just talk about electrical driving forces and just talk about chemical driving forces when so many of the things that are moving are substances that carry charge. So when we look at the electrochemical driving force, the chemical force is the tendency to move down that concentration gradient. So moving from a high concentration of potassium ions to a low concentration of potassium ions, or moving from a high concentration of sodium ions to a low concentration of sodium ions. So it's that's the chemical driving force. You're going down concentration gradients, high to low of the actual substance. So um, the electrical force is the tendency for ions to move in relation to the membrane potential. So it's all about charge. Like, is this moving? This this is moving in because it's a the, it's positive and it's, it's attracted to the negative charge inside. Here we can see a negative thing moving outside of the cell because of the part of the positive charge outside. So if something is moving based on charge, then it is an electrical force. Like I said, it's electrochemical 
you're looking at a combination of those. Sometimes um, those forces, the electrical and chemical work together. They're both moving in the same direction. Sometimes they work opposite of each other. So um, something that's moving in um, based on chemical may oppose the electrical or vice versa. So here we can kind of see when we look at this, here's our, uh, we have a high amount of potassium inside of the cell, a low amount of potassium outside of the cell. So the chemical driving force is moving the potassium outside of the cell because it, it's going from a high concentration to a low concentration of that particular chemical. Then the electrical driving force, since potassium ions carry a charge, a plus one charge, here we can see that it's positive outside of the cell and negative inside. So the, the electrical driving force is bringing them, would be bringing them in. So you can see the electrical, electrical driving force would draw them back in. So when we look at it, what's happening overall, we can kind of see chemical driving force that is equating for a lot of what's happening. Um, the electrical driving force is, is less. So here we have this big yellow arrow, kind of like half of that. Um, this is a blue arrow going in. So the overall electrochemical driving force is slightly is moving the, the net movement of that would be electrochemical is moving it out. Cause if you factor in the potassium moving out for the chemical driving force and the amount of potassium moving in based on the electrical driving force, your overall electrochemical is moving things outside of the cells since the chemical driving force kind of outweighs the electrical driving force you have that that's the kind of that net movement there so we can kind of see um that when we're looking at that portion of the the picture there let's see um, and the same thing happens like with sodium. When we look at sodium, you have high levels of sodium ions outside of the cell and low inside of the cell. So sodium wants to go in because it's chemical. Um, so if we were looking at sodium, sodium would be moving, would want to move in because you have low sodium inside, high sodium outside. So kind of opposite of the, what you're seeing with potassium. But when we look at its electric, its electric driving force, remember, Sodium is positively charged, the inside of the cell is negatively charged. So based on charge, sodium wants to move in um, there. So it's chemical driving force and it's electrical driving force are going in the same direction. Like I said, sometimes they, they match and they are both going in the same direction. Sometimes like this, where we see with potassium, you have one, one force wanting to make those ions move out and one force that wants to make the ions move in. So we can kind of see that happening there. Oops, that's not my mouse. So the equilibrium potential, which is um, represented by the letter capital E, is basically the hypothetical value um, for a membrane potential where the electrical driving force is equal and opposite to the chemical driving force. So that would be equilibrium potential there. Um, when we look at this, the larger concentration gradient means larger equilibrium potentials because the greater electrical force is required to equal or balance out that chemical force. So when we start looking at these, you can basically calculate internal and external ion concentrations and measure those membrane potentials. And that would allow you to basically, um, you know, determine your membrane potential. So if we were looking at, you know, we were looking at the, these, oh, there we go, nope. <clears throat> the hypothetical value. So remember we said our resting membrane potential is negative 70. So, um, you know, that's our negative 70. If we looked at the, the equilibrium of potassium, if we're looking at the potassium, the, um, the chemical and electrical driving forces, if we look at that, we get um, an equilibrium potential of negative 94 millivolts. But we said that the resting membrane potential of a cell overall is negative 70 millivolts. So that tells us that the equilibrium potential is not created solely by potassium. There's some other um, ions that are moving either in or out of the cell that are, are, are setting up that resting membrane potential.
this is the you can I mean a lot of times we just memorize the equilibrium potential for potassium is negative 94. Somebody went through and actually experimentally determined this based on voltage and ion concentrations and all of that. Um, we just now use that data, um, you know, based on, on someone else's work. Um, so by calculating internal and external ion concentrations, and you can measure that membrane potential. Like I said, you could go through, we have the Nernst equation. Once again, here's another equation. You will not have to do any math with this equation. Um, if the ion concentrations are known in the intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid, um, and the equilibrium potential for a particular ion, so potassium, sodium, chlorine, calcium, uh, if they're, they can be calculated, and that would give you the equilibrium potential for that particular element. Like I said, somebody went through and measured and, and experimentally did these to find these equilibrium um, potentials for the different ions. Like I said, we just would use their values, but you could experimentally find that out. Um, and then we're going to compare that to the actual potential measure, so the actual voltage of the membrane. And that's going to tell us, you know, how close, you know, that, that particular um, ion is to kind of helping to set up that, that resting membrane potential. So the Nernst equation is E equals... Um, 61 divided by Z log of the concentration of ions outside of the cell divided by the concentration of ions um, in the cell. So when we look at, at those, like I said, if you look at this and you're like, oh, it looks hard and I don't know what these numbers mean and I don't remember how to do a log of a number, you do not have to do the math for this. This is just kind of showing you um, if you went through and you did the, the math, so here they're showing you, you know, 61 by the log of, you know, concentration in <clears throat> the, um, in your intracellular fluid versus your extracellular fluid, if you fill that in for sodium, so these are the values for sodium, so we had um, 145 divided by 15, so if you do all that math, you get a, a, a number, it's positive 60.1 millivolts. So the, the equilibrium potential for sodium is a positive 60.1 millivolts. So if our resting membrane potential, the average for that is a negative 70 millivolts, how much of that is, how close, how much, do you think that, that sodium has a lot to do with that, that resting membrane potential? No, not, not really, because negative 70 and positive 60 are really far apart. So um, that equilibrium potential tells us that sodium, it may play a little part of it, but it's not setting up the bulk of that resting membrane potential because it's very far from that, that number. However, if we went through and we did the equilibrium potential for potassium, went through and did the math, like I said, somebody went through, measured the, you know, the millimoles of, of potassium inside of the cell in that intracellular fluid and extracellular fluid. They measure those values and then when you plug them into the Nernst equation, they get a negative 94.2 millivolts. So now if we know that the resting membrane potential of a cell is negative 70 and we have negative 94.2 for potassium, and then remember our, our sodium is way up here at positive 60, we can see that potassium has a lot to do with that resting membrane potential. Is it the only ion that sets up the resting membrane potential? No, it's not the only ion, but it has a it has a strong input on on that resting membrane potential because negative ninety four and negative seventy are fairly close together um, when we look at at those values. So here they are together. So this is the Nernst equation showing us the equilibrium potential for sodium. This is our equilibrium potential for potassium. Um, so this says which equilibrium potential is closer to the resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts. You know, like I said, think about a number line. Think about zero. We have positive 60 over here, way over here. Back here we have negative 70 and then negative 94. Our negative 70 and negative 94 are much closer together than our negative 70 and our positive 60 out here. So that tells us that, that the potassium is playing a bigger role in setting up that resting membrane potential.
So when we look at that, potassium moves out of the cell passively, and it's the reason that it sets up most of that membrane potential because that potassium, we have a lot of leaky potassium ion channels. Sodium is much more regulated. There's not very many leaky sodium channels. Sodium, um, it doesn't just leak into the cell easily. You have to actually open sodium channels for that to happen to allow that sodium to come into the cell. We have lots of leaky potassium channels that allow that potassium to move easily out of the cell. So what would the membrane potential be if the sodium membrane potential accounted for most of the millivolts? Well, then we would expect our membrane potential to be much closer to the positive 60 if it was mostly um, the sodium that was setting that up. So we would expect it to be closer to positive 60 if that was the case there. So, but it's not, like I said, most of it is set up from the potassium. So if you know the concentration of the ions um, across that semi-permeable membrane, so inside basically in the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid, you can calculate that membrane potential. Like I said, that's using that Nernst equation. So somebody would go in and have to calculate the millimoles of each of the, you know, how much potassium is inside the cell, how much potassium is outside the cell, plug that into that Nernst equation, and they could calculate the membrane, you know, the potential. Excuse me. If that calculated potential isn't what the actual resting membrane potential is, then it's telling you that it's not solely that ion that's responsible for that. Or it could tell you how closely it's related to the resting membrane potential. Like I said, when we look at sodium, way out here at positive 60 and our resting membrane potential is negative 70, that tells us eh, it doesn't have a whole lot to do with, with that. Whereas negative 70 and negative 94 are relatively close. So that, that's showing us that, that potassium does have a lot to do with setting up that resting membrane potential. So you can also predict ionic movement, knowing the concentrations and knowing that membrane potential. So if you know that you have a lot of negatives inside and a lot of positives outside, you can, um, you know, kind of determine where the ions are going to be moving. So um, in both, when we look at that, like if you look at it moving based on concentration or based on charges, both of those are getting involved in that electrochemical gradient. Um, so from this, you can also determine which ions are going to be pumped across the membrane and which ions are going to move passively um, based on the electrochemical gradients there. And a lot of times they may rush in, but then to move them out, you're going to have to pump them out one way. They'll move in naturally one way or move out naturally one way, and then you have to pump them back because of the those opposite, you know, because of the charges and the concentrations. All right, so the magnitude of your driving force is affected by chemical driving forces, electrical driving forces, and then a lot of times you have things that, that are chemicals that are carrying a charge, so the electrochemical driving forces. So the next factor that we're going to look at, look at that affects flux is going to be surface area. So when we talk about surface area and permeability, you, like I said, we want to think about cells are pretty much a fixed size. So when you look at this, like a, you think about like an epithelial cell or you think about, you know, a, I'm trying to think of what else, like a nerve cell or whatever, just any sort of cell, like a, usually like probably simple squamous epithelial, easy to remember, like that kind of shape. It's pretty, um, you know, just like a little, kind of looks like a fish egg or, you know, a fried egg or whatever. Um, you can't really change the, the, the size of the membrane. However, you can um, increase or decrease the surface area by opening or closing um, these, these ion channels. So remember, those channels are, are you know, specific for different kinds of ions. So it's not like you can open and close just a bunch of them and let any, anything go into them. They are, they are specific to specific ions. So if you change the membrane's permeability to an ion, um, you do that by opening or closing these channels. And that, that can happen many times in a second. And so that's called basically channel gating. So you're, you can basically, 
open or close them, you're you're allowing you you know you're opening or closing the gate, and that's gonna you, you know if the gate's closed, ions can't go through. Gates open, ions can go through that channel. So that's what's called channel gating. And the cells use channel gating a ton to allow things to move into and out of the cell. So we have different kinds of channel conformation. So we have ligand gated, voltage gated, and mechanically gated um, channels. So ligand gated channels are channels that basically require a specific molecule to attach. And when that molecule attaches, it opens the channel. So we will see this when we look at um, the um, passing of an action potential from, from one nerve cell to another, um, that's going to use a ligand gated channel because when you have the action potential come down to the end of one axon, um, it will cause the release of neurotransmitters. Those neurotransmitters will bind um, to active sites on the, the next nerve cell. And when they bind, they're going to open um, channels that are going to allow sodium to rush in. When sodium rushes in, it's going to cause that next um, nerve cell to depolarize and it's going to pass along that nerve conduction. So ligand, ligand gated channels are going to require a specific molecule to bind to them to open up that channel. Whereas voltage gated channels, they, cause, they need changes in membrane potential to cause them to open. Um, so sometimes you might have a ligand, ligand gated channel that's gonna initially allow certain ions to move in, and then that's gonna cause a difference in the electrical potential that could then open further channels down the line. So voltage gated channels are gonna have require changes in uh, membrane potential. So changes in the charge um, inside and outside of that cell. You can also have mechanically gated channels. So mechanically gated channels are going to be channels that have some sort of physical, um, physically deforming or stretching happening that are going to cause um, channels to um, basically be opened or or closed. So um, when we're looking at this, you're going to have some sort of stretch or or. or deformation to a channel and that's going to cause it to change its shape. So we'll be able to kind of see that. Um, all right, so we're going to start here with a ligand gated channel and then um, some voltage gated channels after it. So we're going to watch over here. Here's the little, the little red guy over here. Um, that's some sort of little chemical that is going to bind to a ligand gated channel and that's going to allow that channel to open. It's going to allow a particular um, ion to move in. So here we go. Here's a little ligand. It attaches to basically, you know, a little active site there, receptor site that's for that specific ligand. Once that attaches there, we're going to see that that, that ligand gated channel is going to open up. So now this is open. You can see it looks like a tunnel. So now, let's say this is sodium. Sodium can rush into this because we have high concentration here, low concentration here. So sodium is going to rush in there. Um, and, and more sodium could be, you know, we're showing, you know, one thing rushing in. Uh, but, you know, many sodium ions could be rushing in. And when they rush in, they're carrying their charge with them because a sodium ion is a cation, a positive ion. So it's going to rush in. When that sodium rushes in, it's going to start changing the... Um, voltage inside of the cell. So when it changes the voltage inside of the cell, it will cause, you know, the next, this voltage gated channel to open. When that voltage gated channel opens, well, now more sodium could rush in and it's going to create more positively charged. So now it's going to cause, you know, this one that's voltage gated, voltage gated to open, causing more sodium to rush in, further creating positive charge there which would change the voltage here, opening up that channel, allowing our sodium to rush in, further changing that. So a lot of times when we look at these, you could have the beginning of a sequence be a voltage or a ligand gated channel that will lead to a whole bunch of voltage gated channels opening. And here we kind of simplified it, only one 
ligand gated channel, you could have a whole bunch of ligand gated channels that were opening. Sodium, for instance, rushing in when that sodium rushes in, changes the you know the negative inside of the cell to a positive, causing those voltage gated channels in the proximity in that vicinity to then open up, and then more sodium rushes in. So when more sodium rushes in, you get you know you're changing that voltage more. You know, so it's kind of like a domino effect when you keep on opening these voltage gated channels, more of that that ion can rush in and further changing um, that polarity, opening more voltage gated channels. So that's kind of how voltage gated channels are, are really helpful when we're looking at action potentials we're gonna see um, when we look at nerve impulses. You can also have those, those stretch gated channels. So remember the, um, the ones that are mechanically gated. So when you look at this, so this would be like something like, um, you know, in the GI tract, we see a lot of these mechanically gated channels. So, um, you know, if, if you were looking at the digestive system, if you were looking at the um, small intestines, so the small intestines have three parts. They have duodenum, the uh, jejunum, and the ileum. So when that duodenum is stretched. So when when um, that chyme that leaves the stomach goes into the first part of the small intestines, the duodenum, it causes that to stretch. It can cause these, these stretch gated channels, these mechanically gated channels to open, and that would allow ions to move in when they move in. For instance, if this was sodium again, carrying its positive charge there, it could you know change the voltage, causing then some voltage gated channels open next to it and then further voltage change more sodium rushing in more voltage gated channels opening you know so we can see that so you could have a stretch gated channel and then that could be followed by voltage gated channels um so you know they don't always work just like oh only voltage gated works here or only mechanically gated works here or only um ligand gated works here, they can work in combinations. So, but all of those would be ways to open those gated channels and opening those gated channels is going to allow particular ions to rush either into or out of the cell based on, you know, concentrations and or charges with those. So like I said, gated channels, you may have several different types of channels in one membrane. Um, you can even block channels to stop electrical events. Like I said, this is, I mentioned earlier, mentioned this earlier with the Novocaine or lidocaine. Um, so like I said, if you go to the dentist and they, they say, oh, you have a cavity and we need to fill that. But first we're going to have to drill out the, you know, bad part. And then we're going to have to put that filling in. Um, I don't know about you, but um you know, your teeth are sensitive. Your teeth can just naturally be sensitive to cold when you eat or drink. Can I can't imagine going to the dentist and having them drill into my tooth with no, you know, pain blocking. You have nerves inside of your teeth. So can you imagine they're drilling in there and they hit that nerve? It would be excruciating. So, you know, they what they do is they give you that Novocaine. And like I said, the Novocaine is kind of almost like you'd have those sodium channels and it's like it blocks the sodium channel. So even though you have the sodium there and, you know, you may be deforming channels or trying to have them open, that, that chemical, that Novocaine can prevent those sodium channels from opening, allowing that sodium to rush in. Since the sodium isn't rushing in, you are going to basically not be sending pain signals to the brain, um, even though they're effectively, you know, working areas. They may be touching the, you know, nerves or, you know, causing, you know, you would typically be causing pain signals to be sent, but since they're, the sodium can't rush in, you can't depolarize those, you can't send those signals. So Novocaine works like that. Like I said, lidocaine is the same way. So if you have like a mole, they're going to re remove, like if you go to the dermatologist and they suspect that you have a mole that, that may be cancerous, they're not just going to slice it off. Um, they'll give you some lidocaine, numb that area, basically, Basically, lidocaine does the same thing as Novocaine, blocks those sodium channels, and then the sodium can't rush in. So even though they're cutting into your skin and things like that, uh, you don't 
feel the pain of that because you don't have the the nerve impulses traveling down those those um nerves that that sits pain so here's a little novocaine it comes in and it blocks that so now the sodium even though sodium is there it can't do anything because the novocaine is blocking that channel all right so as we look at the experiments for the day talk about all these um if we look at membrane permeability um most um have been experimentally they they had to run experiments to see um how permeable a particular substance is so it was experimentally determined um they've done this by like radioactively labeling labeling ions that can cross the membrane and then they can track and trace those those labeled like those radioactively labeled ions like I said, whenever they give you radioactively labeled stuff, they pick stuff that has a relatively short half-life so that within a day or so, the, all of that radioactive, you have almost none left because it keeps on losing half of its material in like 26 minutes or something like that. So um, we can kind of see you have to experimentally determine that. Um, mermaid... mermaid. Membrane permeability, two words separate, um, uses basically a mathematical relationship to describe that. That's called Fick's law. So we've seen the Nernst equation. Um, you know, now we have Fick's law here. So basically, the Fick's law says that the net net flux or net flow is basically the permeability times the surface area. So um, the difference in concentration. Um, is going to be affected by how permeable your membrane is, so how many um, channels are opened or how many channels are closed, um, along with um, you know the the surface area. So if you look at um, so how lipid soluble, if you're looking at the plasma membrane and how much surface area you have there, so permeability times surface area. So the greater your permeability, the greater the flux. So the bigger the holes, the more lipid soluble things can go through. So the greater that permeability that you'd have going on there. So once again, why do we care? Mostly we care because um, if you change that permeability, natural processes aren't gonna happen. You're not gonna have the right um, ions and molecules and things going through and getting into or out of the cell like they should, or in the case of medications, you want to pick something that's highly permeable so that it's getting into the cells where it is going to be effective. Um, so um, if we look, if we go back, we've looked at magnitude of the driving forces. So that was chemical, electrical, and electrochemical. Surface area and permeability, both of those affect the flux or flow. So if you increase permeability, you're going to increase the flux. If you increase the surface area, you're going to increase the flux. Um, and then we also have what's called rates of active transport. So pretty much so far, we've looked at passive transports, things that don't require energy go from a high concentration to a low concentration. So... Now we're gonna look at active transport. Active transport moves molecules from a low concentration to a high concentration. So imagine, you know, like when I talked about the air freshener, we spray the air freshener, so the air freshener, we spray that air freshener, and um, as that is sprayed, it goes from the high concentration here where I just sprayed it out and it diffuses across the whole room. So imagine now I want to collect all of that air freshener and gather it all up and put it back into a high concentration. Not that we can really do this, but if we could, you can imagine it would take a lot of energy to kind of gather all of the, the molecules of the air freshener and bring it back into one place. It's the same thing with, you know, like I said, with the, your basket of laundry. It's real easy, it's real passive to just, you know, fling your laundry everywhere. Let it just, wherever it lands, that's where its new home is. It takes a lot more energy to, fold it up, open the drawer, put it in the drawer, fit it all in nicely. Um, but you're going from, you know, like where it's scattered around, you know, kind of a low concentration and you're packing it all into your, into your dresser. 
you're that's a high concentration all the clothes are in that one area instead of being everywhere so it it requires energy it does not happen spontaneously like i said you know it it you know you had to work at folding those clothes and putting them into the drawer um it would be much easier to let everything just go towards this order just dump them in the middle of your floor and wherever they get kicked around as you walk around in there is where they are you know it takes energy it doesn't naturally happen you have to pack them up and put them there so um, here they kind of show you that rolling the rock up the hill that would be kind of like active transport you're going to have to put in energy to get the you know that rock to the, this area of high high energy it requires energy to do that passively the rock is just going to naturally roll down the hill they don't roll themselves up the hill you have to push them up the hill you have to put in energy so when we look at this, um, passive transports can occur, can occur spontaneously, whereas active transports are going to require energy. You have to put in energy to make it happen, whereas passive transports do not require energy. So when we look at this, um, we're going to look a lot at this sodium potassium pump. If you were thinking about Think about our cell that we talked about. Remember, circle K inside of the cell, we have a high concentration of, of potassium outside the cell, a high concentration of sodium. Um, if you want to, you know, if you have sodium inside the cell and you want to get it back outside of the cell um, to kind of keep your membrane potential, um, does the sodium naturally want to go from the lower concentration inside the cell to the higher concentration outside of the cell? No, it's it. You have to use energy to pump the sodium back outside the cell because it doesn't want to go naturally go back to a high concentration of sodium. Same thing with potassium. Does potassium want to go back into the inside of the cell where there's a higher concentration of potassium? No. So you have to use energy to pump that. So here we can kind of see, you know, you can, you know, that's so like the pumps, like if you're using, you know, wind energy to pump, you know, water from the ground, like, you know, it doesn't naturally happen. So when we look at rates of active transport, um, it's determined by the presence of protein pumps. So you have to have some sort of pump that, that is going to allow this to happen. And um, so the rate is affected by the you know the rate of what one pump itself can do and then the number of pumps total so if you think about sodium potassium pump if one pump can you know basically take three sodiums out and then bring two potassium in um and whatever the rate is let's say it could do 50 molecules you know a minute you know the rate is only as fast as you know how fast that one sodium potassium pump can work plus then how many sodium potassium pumps you have overall. So the more pumps you have, the higher the rate of active transport because you have more pumps that can do it. Um, but like I said, you're limited by how quickly it can, can happen. So it's kind of like, you know, if you, you know, like if you work at a, a factory, let's say that, you know, you know, you're building cars and you're not building them all by yourself, but let's say that it takes, you know, five days to build a car. I have literally no idea like how, you know, and they're making more than that, but let's just pretend it takes five days to make a car. You, you know, so if you have a machine that, you know, from start to finish, all the machines that work together, it takes five days to get everything put together and done um, to, to make your car. Um, you know, if you have one machine, or one set of the machines that does all the, the jobs to make your car um, and it takes five days to get through the whole process, you know, every five days you're going to make a car. Well, if you need to make more than one car every five days, then you would need to invest in more of that machinery so that you could, you could increase your output of cars that you are, are making. So, you know, the more pumps you have, the faster the process is going to go because you have, or the more, the you know, more things you're going to be able to pump out because you just have more of those membrane pumps. But the, the pumps themselves can only work as fast as they work. All right, so that's going to be looking at, at active 
transport. And we're going to come back to active transport, but I wanted to kind of remind you, active transport uses energy and it works against concentration gradients um, typically. And then we're going to also see that there are some things that require energy that don't necessarily work against the concentration gradient, but do require ATP because they change the shape of the membrane. So now we're going to look at some different transport methods. How do we get stuff inside and outside of the cell? So we have simple diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. So simple diffusion, when we look at simple diffusion, um, you basically, um, we look at the membrane permeability is influenced by the nature of the substance diffusing. Is it lipid soluble or is it not? Um, and then the properties of of that membrane. So we're going to look at both of those. So if we look at that dis diffusing substance, if it's lipid soluble, um, it can go right through the phospholipid bilayer. So if it's hydrophobic or lipophilic, it can pass right through the phospholipid bilayer. Hydrophilic molecules have to go through pores. So um, you can have things that are diffusing through that, that cell membrane but um, you know when it when that happens, um, usually simple diffusion means it's going right through the phospholipid bilayer. It doesn't have any pores. It doesn't have anything assisting it. Um, so when we start looking at hydrophilic molecules, it it isn't simple diffusion anymore because it's going to require that pore channel to let it go in. Um, so. The size and the shape of that diffusing molecule can basically influence the um, simple diffusion. Um, basically, the larger the molecule, the slower that process would be. So larger molecules diffuse more slowly. And that goes back to that experiment with our little auger petri dish and our two little crystals. The one with the higher um, molecular weight diffused slower. It had a, a smaller diffusion ring or the diameter of the fusion ring was less. When we looked at the, the lighter molecular weight substance, that one had a larger diffusion ring because it was able to diffuse through that substance more quickly. So larger molecules diffuse more slowly than smaller molecules. So if you had something like oxygen, it can diffuse through the plasma membrane very quickly, which is really important because we start thinking about how long our red blood cell is in the capillaries of your lungs. It's like 0.1 seconds before it's zipping through. So it has to be able to have that diffusion happening very rapidly, exchanging oxygen and carbon dioxide very, very rapidly through the, the membranes there. So, but larger molecules are gonna diffuse more slowly. So if you started looking at some sort of lipid-based molecule, like maybe a steroid that's much bigger than oxygen, it will take longer to diffuse than something like small, like oxygen. Um, when we look at that, the temperature can affect our diffusion rates. Remember, things if you increase the temperature, things are going to be moving more rapidly. The more rapidly they're moving, the more likely they are to bump into um, that membrane and diffuse. So warmer temperatures allow molecules to move more quickly. Um, like, like what we talked about with entropy, if they're moving more quickly, the more likely they are to bump into that membrane, the more likely if they bump into the membrane, the more that they're going to um, diffuse. So increasing the temperature is going to increase diffusion. Decreasing the temperature is going to decrease diffusion. So, you know, if you lower your body temperature, you're going to lower that, um, the body's metabolic activity rate because things are moving more slowly. All right, membrane thickness. So this is really important because remember we talked about how your membrane's kind of set as far as like the area, the size, but the thickness um, can be affected and that can really affect how easily things can diffuse. So when we look at this, um, you know, usually it doesn't change, but if you had um, some sort of fibrosis, so you had scar tissue to um, a particular type of, of cells or tissues, or if you had like certain kinds of diseases, like, you know, if you um, contract pneumonia um, and it starts to have fluid um, sitting over the, the membranes, that can um, basically affect diffusion. So if you have um, a layer of water over, you know, the membranes, 
that's that much more that that oxygen and carbon dioxide have to travel through. So it's going to make breathing harder because you don't, you're not able to exchange the oxygen and carbon dioxide at the, the correct rates, the, the typical rates, because you have a thicker, a thicker membrane, because not only do you have the, just the, the single layer of the um, simple squamous epithelium, now you have liquid on top of that. So the membrane thickness, like I said, typically, if you don't have any, so if you ha are normal and healthy and don't have fibrosis or scar tissue forming, and you don't have something that's, that's creating like fluid or uh, excessive mucus or something like that, you know, the, the membrane thickness pretty much stays the same when you are healthy. Um, so thicker membranes, you're going to see slower diffusion. So if you think about, like I said, like the membranes of the lungs, you have those simple squamous epithelial, they're yeah, epithelium, they're very thin. So it's going to allow for diffusion to happen very rapidly. Um, but if you get fluid in places like the lungs, it can, it, in effect, it makes that membrane thicker because you have layers on top of that. I mean, it's just water, but it still makes that thicker when you're thinking about molecules moving. All right, so we looked at simple diffusion that can go right through that the plasma membrane. The smaller it is, the faster it goes. If you increase the temperature, you're going to increase diffusion. Um, when we looked at that, so facilitated diffusion, if I facilitate something, I would help. If I facilitate you, I would help you do something. Um, so when we look at this, facilitated diffusion means diffusion. So going from a high concentration to a low concentration, but you need something to help you do that. So um, when we look at that, these are things that are going to not be able to pass directly through that phospholipid bilayer. So we're looking at things that are um, basically hydro, you know, like they're hydrophilic. So they have, they're those water loving charged molecules. So they, they, you know, when you think about things like sodium, potassium, you know, charged ions, they cannot go right through that. Even though they're small, they can't go right through that plasma membrane because they carry that charge. So they require a helper molecule. They're going to need to have a protein pore or channel to travel through. So those hydrophilic substances um, and things like sugars, amino acids, inorganic ions, so that's like sodium, potassium, calcium, all those things um, are going to require um, the help of a transport, transport protein. So it, it may have a name that's called a channel, it may have a name called a pore, um, but it's going to have basically some sort of transporting protein that's going to assist it or help it through, you know, to get from one side of the cell to the other. So here, this one right here, this is showing us, here's our little phospholipid bilayer. On here, we don't see any proteins at all. And we can see high concentration and to low concentration. We can see those things are going directly through that phospholipid bilayer. That would be simple diffusion, high to low concentration, directly through the phospholipid bilayer. Um, facilitated diffusion, you can have channels or you can have carriers. So here we can see that both of these high are going high to low concentration. They're both using some sort of protein as a transporter. Um, but with that, a channel is more like a pore, like we're just like more like a tunnel, whereas um, carriers typically like change shape, something will attach when they change shape. Um, these don't really change shape, but they're set up for a specific molecule nonetheless. Um, so much like simple diffusion, they go high to low concentration. However, they do require that protein channel or protein carrier. So they require a, a specific protein molecule to, that, that allows them to go into or out of the cell. Like I said, high to low concentration. So all of these, all, whenever you see diffusion, you want to think high to low concentration. So a high concentration to a low concentration. It's just facilitated as you're going to have that protein transporter molecule associated with it. Over here now, though, this is active transport. Active transport goes from a low concentration to a high concentration. So you're actively going in the natural tendency. This is, you're, you're taking an area of low concentration and pushing those things into an area that already has a lot. So that's not the natural tendency. So it will require ATP. So once again, you're going to have some sort of protein pump now that's going to use ATP to 
to move things against the concentration gradient there. Oh, I don't know why it did that. Okay, so if we look at the difference between a carrier and a channel. So when we look at carriers, they're transmembrane proteins. So transmembrane, trans means it crosses both sides of, of our phospholipid bilayer. So it's transmembrane and it's protein-based. Um, in it, it will have a specific shape in which a molecule will bind to one side of the membrane. When it binds to that, that kind of like active site, it will cause that, that transmembrane protein to change shape. And when it changes shape, it will move that molecule from either outside to inside the cell or inside the cell to outside the cell, whichever direction it's moving that. Um, but it has to bind to a specific shape. Like, so here is a glucose carrier protein, if I get my thing. And it has a specific shape, so a glucose molecule will fit in there. When it fill, fits into that spot, it will cause this to change conformation or change shape. And when it changes shape, it's going to move that glucose from outside of the cell to inside of the cell. Once it's released, it goes back to its original shape or conformation, where it is ready to accept the next glucose molecule. Like I said, carriers are going to change shape. Um, they can have one or more binding sites. This one shows one. You can have more than one, and they're going to change shape when that substrate binds. So that substance, like glucose in this instance, it could be, you, know, you could have different carriers that bind different substances. Um, and once it binds, it changes shape, brings that, in, like in this instance, into the cell. It could work the opposite and push stuff out of the cell as well. Um, and once it's um, open to the opposite side of that, that membrane, it's going to release that and then go back to the original conformation. So a carrier can move a solute in either direction, um, but they're going to basically, typically they're moving from high concentration to low concentration. So it's going down that concentration gradient. And um, it, like I said, it's very similar to simple diffusion, except it's using that transmembrane protein. So it has, it's, it's facilitated. It needs, needs help. Um, we also have channels. So channels are transmembrane proteins. Um, they're made specifically for specific substances. Even though they look like a little tunnel, they have a, a shape that is specific um, uh, to particular kinds of, of substances. They're mostly used for ions. So think of like your chloride ion, sodium ion, potassium ion, calcium ion. They're going to use these little these little um, channels. Um, there are specific channels that are just for water um, and they allow a large amount of water to be moved in a small amount of time. These uh, specific channels that are just for water are called aquaporins. So basically water pores is, you know, so hopefully that makes sense. Aquaporins are to move water. Um, when we look at the difference between um, these two, types of um, types of facilitated diffusion, we can look at um, basically the transport rate of carriers and the number of carriers. So if we look at, so remember carriers are the ones that change shape um, and then the pores are more like, almost like tunnels. So it's kind of like having a little tunnel, things just go through and the, the, the protein doesn't change its shape. So um, pores are faster than carriers. Glucose carriers can move about 10,000 glucose molecules in a second, which is pretty speedy if you think about it, 10,000 molecules a second. A sodium pour, on the other hand, so the little pour that doesn't have to change shape, in one second it can move 10 million ions. So it's moving a huge quantity of ions in a second. Like It makes this 10,000 per second look like nothing, you know, when you look at that. So when we look at this, um, the permeability in your facilitated diffusion, it depends on how fast, what's the transport rate. So um, the pores are going to be a lot faster than the carriers so that, you know, carriers move a little bit more slowly, but then also it would be, you know, it would be based on the number of carriers or the number of pores is also going to affect that, that permeability. So you can kind of see you, you might need less pores because they can move, each pore can move a lot more of those, you know, ions in a second than you could when you look at 
the carriers, they can move less per second. You can, um, when we look at this, you can constant, you can basically saturate carry, saturate carriers. So normally you would say, if you increase the concentration, you're going to increase that flow. Because, you know, if you double the concentration, you're going to double the flow. If you triple the concentration, you're going to triple the flow. However, if, you know, when you're talking about uh, just things that go right through the plasma membrane, like simple diffusion, it does typically like go in that nice linear line. However, when you're looking at things like um, carriers that are a little, I mean, slower, like I said, they still are moving a lot of molecules in a second. It's just not as many as like a pore or what can go right through the plasma membrane. Um, so you can saturate the carriers. So if all the carriers are being used, like, so if you're looking at this at first, you know, you have plenty of carriers available. And as you get more and more um, concentration of, of your solute they're moving, like the glucose, um, you're going to see that the, the rate goes up. But then at a certain time, at a, you know, at a certain concentration, it levels off. It goes kind of flat. So you, you kind of plateau. Why does it do that? Why doesn't, why doesn't it have this nice linear relationship? So imagine like, you know, the doors, you know, so, you know, if we had, you know, 10 people in this room and remember we have three doors in our classroom. So 10 people. And I say, you can leave through any door you want, you know, um, you know, everybody can go out door. We're getting out really pretty quickly, you know? So that was, that was 10 people. Then we have 20 people in here using the three doors yeah, still, you know, we're, you know, or maybe not everybody's using every door. Maybe when there's 20 people in here, everybody's going out the one door and it's great. Um, let's say that we now have, you know, 40 people in here. 40 people are like, be a line. So some people start using the other door. And then maybe we have, we have 60 people. So 60 people here. So now we're using the third door because there's a lot of people and we don't all want to wait in the line forever. So, you know, but at a certain point, we, we've kind of saturated our doors. Like if we had a hundred people, I mean, it would be real tight in here. We had a hundred people in this room. Um, even though we're using all three of our doors available with a hundred people in here, we're all going to have to kind of, you know, not everybody can get out at the same time. We're going to have to kind of wait in line. We've saturated all of our doors. Everybody, you know, everybody's, you know, having to wait in line to leave the room. So, you know, it's kind of like that where, at a certain point, all of those carriers are being used. And so it doesn't matter how much more the concentration is. If the carrier is working at maximum capacity, we can't make it go any faster. We can't, we can't increase that flow or flux because you've already maxed it out. You, you use every, you use every one of the carriers that's occupied. So even though we still have a whole bunch of molecules out here wanting to get into the cell, they have to wait for a carrier to become available. So once you saturate those carriers, they can't go, they can't work any faster. There's not, they, they're working as that capacity here. Um, so like I said, simple diffusion, the flux rate is only limited by the concentration. So as you increase the concentration, you're gonna increase that flux or flow. It's gonna be directly proportional. You're gonna get that nice linear line. If you're carrier mediated, so you're using carriers, um, that one, you will, at first you'll see it kind of grow, going up, you know, as you increase the concentration, you're going to see that flux going up, but there's going to be an upper limit on the flux, like, because once you've saturated those carriers, once they're all working, you can't make it go any faster because you're limited by the number of carriers you have available. So hopefully that makes sense that, you know, if you're looking at simple diffusion going right through the plasma membrane doesn't require any special molecule, it just zips through as long as there's space on that membrane it just goes right in carries on the other hand they, those are specific molecules so once you have something bound to that and it's changing shape that one is not able to accept any any other molecule so you know if you have all of your carriers working and you still have molecules out there waiting to get in they can only you can only you can only have that maximal flux based on the, the number of carriers. So you get to that plateau at kind of saturation point here. Um, so when, like I said, facilitated diffusion carriers with a fixed number can be saturated. You're gonna reach a maximum transport rate. 
Um, to increase the concentration gradient, you'd, you would have no effect. Like I said, once you get to this point where you hit that plateau, it doesn't matter if you have 100, you know, your concentration is 100, 300, 500, 1,000. Oops. Um, once you hit this point where you've saturated it, it's the, the flux or flow just has leveled off because all your, your carriers are working. Um, channels may not show saturation because they can move those ions so rapidly. Um, potentially they could, but usually they don't because like I said, they're moving, you know, a million ions a second. So they're just passing them through there really, really quickly. Um, they have the potential to, but they typically don't show saturation, not like your, not like your carriers do, because the carriers have to have the shape, they have to attach, they have to chain shape, drop that off, then change their shape back so they can accept another molecule. Um, so they can definitely show that that saturation where you get that plateau right there. All right, so factors that determine solute flux. So, um, so here's the extent to which carrier is a carrier is saturated. So all those sites are full. Um, it depends on the concentration of your solute. So obviously the more, like when you're looking at, at your little um, graph here, the more, the higher concentration grow, goes, the more of those carrier molecules that will have, you know, a particular molecule attached to it. Um, you also have to look at the affinity of the carrier protein for the solute. So sometimes um, affinity is like how much they like like each other. So how, how strongly there is an attraction between that. So you may have a carrier that, that has, um, you know, a shape. And if you, you know, the, if the affinity is low, um, the less likely it is to kind of attract those, those molecules to bring them in. So the higher the affinity, the more attractiveness it has to that, that protein, the solute and that, that protein carrier have. And so the faster it's going to go. If it has low affinity, um, it's going to take longer because it doesn't have that attraction there. Um, when we look at, at that, so affinity, you know, is, is going to be important for helping to move those. Um, so like, I was trying to see what else, like, you know, like if you have like an affinity, you know, like if you're using, um, you know, myoglobin can't hold on to oxygen, um, you know, if you have a lot of lactic acid built up in your muscles, so it'll affect the affinity of that, that carrier protein. Um, the number of carrier proteins in the membrane. So obviously the more carrier proteins, the higher that, that solute flux or flow is going to be, the lower the number of them, the lower that's going to, to be. Um, and then transport rate of carriers, how fast do they work? How fast do they attach, change their shape, get, you know, dump that, that, that specific molecule into the cell or out, depending on which way it's moving. And then how back, how quickly do they, they go back to that original shape so they can accept another um, solute molecule. So all of those things are kind of um, affecting, you know, the, the rate of those, those carriers. I'm going to look at do a couple more on this one and then we'll stop here so we don't get them too long. All right, so permeability, um, the membrane permeability and facilitated diffusion is regulated by the availability of channels, so open or closed um, by electrical signals and neurons. Um, you could have chemicals that can block channels. Um, hormones can alter the number of carriers that are available. So those channels and carriers can be affected by electrical signals. So if you have electrically gated channels, if you, um, you know, they could be opened or closed based on that. Um, chemicals, like I said, like things to think of like Novocaine or calcium channel blockers, um, those can block those channels and affect, you know, the permeability, how much of calcium or how much of sodium is able to get in or out, or it may be prevented fully. 
um, for that given time. Um, you could have hormones. Like I said, hormones can alter the number of carriers. So insulin is a hormone and it can increase glucose carriers. So um, if you have, you know, you know, a lot of insulin is going to increase those glucose carriers and then you can transport more glucose there. So um, this is kind of helping with permeability. So it's, you know, sometimes it's not as simple as, oh, I have plenty of channels or carriers. If you have things blocking them, that can affect the permeability. So that's not as simple as just, just the one, like the, the number of them there. So pores, like I said, are faster than carriers. So glucose carriers 10,000 per second versus sodium pore, which is 10 million ions per second. Um, like I said, hormones, for instance, insulin could affect the number of carriers um, to the muscle and adipose tissue. Um, so some glucose is transported, um, glucose, some glucose transported, um, it will not, not be affected by insulin. So glucose can be quickly metabolized in cells to, um, G6P, which, um, maintains concentration gradients. So your body does a lot of things where, um, instead of allowing concentration, like, so if you're bringing glucose into cells, you would build up, you know, a, a bunch of glucose in the cells. And so then the concentration gradient wouldn't be there. So glucose wouldn't go want to go into the cells. So what your cells do is they'll quickly convert glucose to basically they'll add a phosphate to glucose. So it's, it's pretty much glucose just slapped a phosphate on it. Once you slap that phosphate on it, then your body's like, oh, something different. So it'll keep on being able to pump. It keeps that concentration gradient going. So you can keep on moving glucose into cells. So your, your body can do little tricks that, that will keep those concentration gradients um, working because if you're going from a high concentration to a low concentration, if you're sending glucose in, eventually you're going to get to equilibrium until your cells break that down for ATP. How do you avoid that from happening? Oh, well, you can do nifty little, your cells can do things by taking glucose and adding phosphate. Now it looks like a different, now it's a different thing. So it can keep on bringing that glucose in because you haven't gotten to equilibrium, you know, with, with the concentration gradients there. All right, so here we looked at diffusion, going high concentration to low concentration, right through your phospholipid bilayer, no protein carrier or um, channel is needed. Here we have facilitated diffusion, going from high concentration to low concentration. Here we see our little plasma membrane, but we have this white little blob right there. That is that transmembrane protein. It's either a channel or a carrier, but it's some sort of protein structure that's, that's assisting. It's facilitating the movement of that particular ion or molecule. Then the last picture we're seeing here, this is active transport. So we're going from a low concentration to a high concentration. It does require a protein pump and it's going to also require ATP or energy. So we can turn up to see that. Um, so do one more slide and then we'll stop before I get to the sodium potassium pump. So active transport utilizes energy. It needs ATP to make the process go. Um, some cells use up to 40% of the energy, that ATP, um, for active transport. They use a lot of it for that sodium potassium pump to pump the potassium out of the, uh, pump potassium back into the cell and the sodium back out of the cell. Um, so you're, you're basically, it requires energy because you're moving solutes against their, their electrochemical gradient against those concentration gradients. You're going, you're sending things to a high concentration from low concentration to a high concentration gradient, or you're putting, um, you're working against the electrical. So you're taking something that's negatively charged and putting into an area that's already negatively charged or, you know, positive to a positive. Um, so it, you're, you're going against the electrical and chemical gradient. So it's going to require ATP because it's going against the natural tendency of things. All right, so we're going to stop here and um, we will um, basically stop here for now and then I will do start with sodium potassium pump in the next.
basically our next um, video.